Hey guys, tonight we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is another one of what's classified as an autoimmune disease. Um, but um, keep in mind, you know, all of these um, may look a little different and some of them aren't officially autoimmune, but um, they, a lot of them have very similar characteristics to that in that they, um, they affect Effect, or you could say immune altering um, disease processes. So they can affect your immune system or it can be a process where something is not working the way that it's supposed to in your body. So, um, you know, what Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's is, it's a chronic progressive difficulty, not only just starting, but also executing movements. And a lot of it goes back to, you know, there's different theories about it and there's definitely multiple factors there, but a lot of it has to do with the lack of dopamine. Um, this is going to be seen more commonly in those that are older, and it's more common in men than it is in women. Um, and there, there's an acronym that's in your book, and it's also, um, you know, an easier one to remember about what does um, Parkinson's look like, and it's what's called TRAP. And so tremor, rigidity, acnesia, and postural instability. So we're going to break down each of those and look at them a little bit closer. So what is TRAP? So first let's talk about the trimmer. So they have what's called um, a pill rolling trimmer, which is what you see in this um, PowerPoint slide in this little GIF. Um, it can affect their ability to write and it's more prominent at rest. In other words, when they're not moving, they can have this. It's, it's known as a pill rolling trimmer because it almost looks like they're rolling a pill between their fingers. So that's one of the first telltale signs of Parkinson's disease. They also have what's rigidity, that's the R. And rigidity is a resistance to passive range of motion. So what we call, the, the word for it is cogwheel rigidity. Um, and what that means is that when like, when you're um, you know, trying to passively move um, one of their joints, it almost is like a cogwheel, like it feels like you're cranking something um, because there's a resistance in that joint to that passive range of motion. Um, and because of that rigidity, they can have muscle soreness, fatigue, and be slow to be able to move. Um, there's also what is um, the A, which is akinesia. And th there's a couple parts to this. Akinesia, remember, means A means without, and kine like kine style, uh, kinesiology means movement, which apparently I can't do with my tongue tonight. So apologize for that. <laughs> so, but um, akinesia without movement. So um, this is where there's no none, I should say none, <laughs> no or minimal, <laughs> none or minimal voluntary muscle movement. So in other words, um, you know, uh, they're going to have trouble initiating movements. And they can also have slow movements like bradykinesia where like they're trying to move, but it takes them a long time. It's almost like they natch, uh, they lack the natural ability to. So in other words, it's not that they've forgotten how to do the movement. It's like their brain, um, like it, it the there's something wrong with the wiring where they cannot start that movement or they cannot, um, you know, uh, can continue with or complete that movement. Commonly patients with Parkinson's can have a stooped posture, what's called a mask face, which is kind of literally looks like a mask on your face. It looks kind of like a sad face or like a very like fixed face. I don't, it's not even like the eyes. It's just very flat. Um, and they can also have what's called a shuffling gait. Like they're trying to move, but all they can really do is shuffle um, very, very slowly to make movements. Um, and then the last part is the, for the P is postural instability. So it's the inability to stop themselves from being pushed forward and or the inability to stop themselves from being pushed backwards. So if they were sitting up on a chair and I just lightly touched their shoulder, they have like, even though they're being propelled forward and most of us would be like, whoa, stop. They don't have the ability to stop. So if I push them forward, they're gonna keep going. If I push them backwards, they're gonna keep going because they do not have the ability to regain that posture when it becomes like unstable, like to find that coordination or balance. Um, and so that's what's called the pull test. So usually you have them sit down and you kind of give them a light push and then see if they're able to you know, maintain their posture or not. Um, they can also have other symptoms. They can have a lot of anxiety and depression. They can have bowel and bladder inch issues, have retention or constipation. They can have memory changes, um, sleeping difficulties as well. And those sleeping difficulties are really common in these patients. 
So we diagnose it mostly based on symptoms, but we can get a CT MRI to rule out other causes. Um, and the treatments kind of vary. There's medications, of course. Um, and then we also do things like deep brain stimulation or ablation. And that deep brain stimulation helps a lot with that um, dopamine imbalance and things like that. Um, working closely with physical therapy and occupational therapy is key. Because remember, a lot of these patients, their problem is motor related, starting and completing motor tasks. Um, working with the nutrition is key because diet is closely related with this as well and the proper diet for these patients is so key um, and there's also surgeries like um, that they can do within their um, brain you know to help with some of the symptoms that they're experiencing to help with the tremors and some of the other things that they're going through so let's talk about anti-Parkinson's drug, uh, anti-Parkinson drugs. Um, so effectively we need more dopamine or less acetylcholine because those kind of work opposite. So it's going to help to find that balance. So usually um, some of the medications that are used are you're going to, they're all going to have dopa in them for like dopamine. So carbidopa or levodopa, um, and that's going to help us give more dopamine. So um, the thing about these medications, they can be, they can have um, what are called tardive dyskinesias, um, which, um, you know, are like um, repetitive, like like mouth symptoms and stuff like that, kind of like the smacking or that. I can't, I can't do it while talking at the same time, but it's like, um, it's like a strange tongue movements and lip movements and mouth movements and things like that. But um, it can be, um, it can be a sign that, that, that they've had too much and can be a sign of toxicity. So we definitely need to um, watch for those closely, those muscle, um, abnormal muscle movements. Uh, these medications can take weeks to months to start to be effective. Um, they should report any uncontrolled movements or difficulty urinating. Um, this medication sadly do lose their effectiveness over time. Um, and so, um, you know, like I have here at the bottom, there's like a wearing off phenomenon with a lot of these medications where they have on off symptoms. So like they're working for one, it's like, oh, everything's going great. Then suddenly they stop working so much. And so usually they have to switch up the medications they're on. So um, that's why like with this, there's a lot of changing up of medications um, and trying to find the right combination. So that way over time, because again, this is progressive and chronic that um, those uh, we can still have something that's working for them. Um, there's also, um, uh, there's Rapinenrol um, and Pramapexel, um, and I'm probably saying this horribly, but um, that also helps to give you more dopamine. And there's a lot of medications in your book. Um, these are some of the ones that I've seen most commonly given. These are the ones I'm trying to bring up. Um, and I said, the other thing we can do is also have less acetylcholine um, and medications like that are the ben, uh, benztropine and then antihistamines like diphenhydramine. Um, those are anticholinergic and um, can help to, uh, you know, balance, uh, find that balance balance in the brain for that patient so that can decrease their symptoms and improve their quality of life. Um, there's also nutritional therapy. So a lot of these patients, because of their weakness, they can also have dysphagia or bradykinesia. So um, just kind of like the patient with um, uh, myasthenia gravis, they need to eat easy to chew and swallow foods like bite size. So this patient's going to be more at risk for aspiration. So we definitely want to watch them and um, watch, do a good swallow evaluation and make sure that they're eating safely. Um, these clients can commonly have constipation. They're not very mobile um, and because a part of their disease process as well. Um, um, and so increased fiber, increased um, fruit is very helpful for them. Um, we encourage six small meals a day to help provide the energy that they need. Um, and you're going to have to have a lot of patience with these patients. Um, so, you know, have a lot of extra time, if possible, plan for that, um, if that's needed. Um, and uh, with the levodopa, there's some protein um, interactions, like protein can decrease the effectiveness of levodopa. So um, we want to put our, pro um, take our levodopa in the morning and then take our protein intake later in the evening um, separate from that levodopa so that we do not um, have that interaction or decrease effectiveness. So overall management for um, uh, Parkinson's disease, I really want this patient to have adequate mobility um, and functional capacity, just like a lot of our other um, disorders in this section. I just want them to be able to take care of themselves to be able to be mobile and have that independence. Adequate neurological functioning, so something that's a little different about this one, um, is they um, losing of their memory and their cognitive functions. And so um, really just needing to keep a close eye on their safety um, and make sure that I'm protecting for that. 
Nutrition is going to be a top goal, a goal for uh, Parkinson's disease because um, there's a high risk that they could have nutritional deficiencies. Um, and then general safety, fall preventions, and preventing complications. Because these patients, again, like they get in these frozen, they get frozen sometimes. I'm going to talk in a minute what to do when they get frozen, but they can freeze and not be able to move. And so that can be a huge safety risk. Um, so, you know, working with PT and OT is going to be so key for these patients. Um, and there's a couple things that so they get frozen, like literally they're walking or they're doing that like shuffling gait and then they frozen, they have no ability to move. So, um, sometimes there's things like mental imaging, um, which is like literally imagining themselves walking can help, um, rocking back and forth. Like sometimes we can take them and kind of help them to rock. Um, and that can help to kind of get momentum to get them going. Um, walking to a beat can help. Um, and then also swinging their arms helps to prevent freezing. Uh, we want to create a safe environment to prevent falls or other injuries, promote their independence as much as we can. Um, it can be very hard for people to lose their independence and, you know, really want to be able to complete these movements, but they just can't do them. Uh, we want to monitor their mental status closely and provide a lot of um, therapeutic communication. Um, because again, a lot of there's a lot of anxiety, depression, mental illness, lack of sleep, cognitive issues and things like that as well. So that's Parkinson's disease in a uh, little bucket. Hopefully it's a bucket that <laughs> made sense. Um, and I'll see you for the next recording. Bye.